I'm Daniel. I'm part of the real time kernel team at Red Hat, and I'm also a postdoctoral researcher at Scuola Superior Santana in Pisa, where I try to live in between these two worlds of the development and research, right? So, relax. This is not a heavy uh, talk. I will not go into much details, but it's more an open ended talk, presenting some talks and pointing to the directions. And people will see links on QR codes during the presentation, right? So, what is real time, right? Real time systems are computing systems that the correct behavior does not depend only on the functional behavior, but also in the timing behavior. That is, the, the logical result is only correct if it is produced before a given deadline. So the response time is also important. Uh, in the real time theory, the things work somehow like this. So we start to create a precise definition of the system, try to capture all the behaviors. And we try to imagine some algorithm, try to define the worst case scenarios and come up with some formulas to show that results are, are delivered before the, the deadline. Uh, there are some uh, theories that are straightforward to understand, like the DDF or single core, but there are others that are more complex, right? And if, when I say complex, it's in that complex that it, it generally requires some years of understanding of these mathematics behind the real time. So uh, the real time system theory is generally considered a, a complex uh, subject because the mathematical reasoning is complex. And uh, in order to facilitate the development of new theories, some assumptions are made to, to facilitate the reasoning, right? Like assuming that the system is fully preemptive because it, it's easy to, to think in this way, assuming that the, all the processes of a system are independent, that uh, overheads are tolerable. And, uh, and yes, think things are this way because it would be too complex to, to be reviewed and established otherwise. And on the other corner, we have Linux, which has a more practical approach, right? Uh, the real-time Linux is not a single thing, but instead a set of features that tries to provide a more deterministic behavior for Linux. And, and, uh, and the approach works more like, okay, we have a metric to be maximized. For example, we have the, the scheduling latency <clears throat> and some background is generally considered like, Okay, in the, the theory, the preemptive model is a good thing for, for this, so we try to mimic that. And then some testing tools generally develop, right? And user space testing tool like cycling test. And, and this go again for, for other metrics. <clears throat> so nowadays the main features for the real-time Linux, we can say, which is the, the full preemptive mode with Prem30, we have SCAT deadline and lock with PI, and so on. But in the same, same way that mathematics, Linux is complex. And many times some assumptions are made to facilitate the development. Uh, for example, the preemptive mode of Linux is not the preemptive mode on the theory because we can uh, disable, disable the preemption temporarily. In the same way, the SCAD deadlines uh, accept some things that are not uh, yet formalized. For example, uh, per CPU threads mixed with global scheduling. So, but, some th these things are, are accepted because otherwise it would be too complex and we'll go nowhere else, right? So, in one hand, these things are good. These uh, these simplifications are good because they enable the progress and they are enabling Linux on a set of, of environments, but they create this gap between the two in practice. So, but, well, who cares about real-time Linux and, and why is it important to, to try to put these two things together? <clears throat> in, in our current use case, we are seeing high frequency trading, some embedded electronics, some low latency virtualization case that, that enables Linux and that push the, the real-time Linux forward. But in the future, we are starting seeing more complex scenarios, right? We are starting to see a uh, system with lots of real-time tests instead of having one real-time test or one per CPU. And we are seeing the usage of Linux on safe critical systems. And the, here is where uh, the things start to get more complex, right? Because safety critical systems, they require a more uh, higher level of insurance of the system behavior with some evidence that it works correctly. And uh, to the point that uh, tests are good, but sometimes the other things like formal methods could uh, make this evidence more strong and enable 
Linux for more complex and critical uh, environments. So, and here are back again, this, this theory and practice and try to, to make them together. Luckily, some things have changed in the near past, right? So, and, and here's an example with the preemption theory versus practice. So, with the preemptive RT, the kernel becomes more preemptive, which is uh, as preemptive as possible. Everything becomes a task, uh, the preemption is enabled by default, and we have some good results measured by cyclic tests on user space, saying that, okay, my scheduling latency is, is in this amount of microseconds. Uh, uh, this is good because, okay, it, it enabled Linux uh, to, 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 to be used on real-time system and enable the development of theories that, that relies on it like SCAD deadline. But yet, there is no clear description of the factors that cause the latency. There is no evidence that worst case scenario was ever hit by cyclic tests. So it, it's hard to convince a skeptical person, right? So how, how, how can we try to make Linux more scientific and compliant, let's say? Right? Well, we can try to follow that algorithm that people in the academia work, which is trying to create, create a precise definition of the system, create an algorithm, trying to find worst case, and define some set of equations. Uh, luckily, and that's, uh, that's something that we also see on the application of other things for, for safety critical, um, most of the kernel already works, and there is the code there, and many times we don't actually need to create an algorithm, but just to analyze Linux with a new perspective, right? So yes, it's possible to try such approach. For example, the scheduling latency definition. We said that scheduling latency definition uh, is the longest time between the arrival of a highest priority job and when it starts executing its own code. Then we created a formal model that represents all the kernel events that could cause this delay or that influence in this metric. From that, from all these events, we draw using a, a formal method what could be the worst case uh, scenario for this latest, define a set of variables, and came up with a, a, a bound for the schedule latency. And this was accepted by, by, a, by the real time kernel community in theory, right? So this was a good advance as a real time community because. For a long time, Linux was criticized by being uh, not uh, explored academically, right? Or, or not explored in the same rigor that they use there. Things have changed. Now, Linux, we, we create some sort of theory that backs Linux up. But still, right? Theory without proxy is not that, that useful for, for me as a developer, right? So, we created also a, a practical schedule latency measurement tool that uses that formula, capture the events of the kernel that influence on the variables of that formula, but still trying to minimize the overhead that it causes, right? Because we need to deal with too much events. Okay, I, I, I don't have time here to explain this, right? But you can check the presentation of the Linux plumbers last year that I presented in the detail, in details how these two works, and it's available on my GitHub, and you can check more about it on, on my my web page. Right? And it has an output that tells me how much uh, latency the system has, considering some kinds of interrupts. And where is the from where the, the, the latest came from, which is is it this variable or is it this interruption? And uh, with that, we could bound together the theory and practice, right? And at the end, what, one thing that we feared when trying to, to make this more pessimistic and worst case things from theory, only we, we fear that the values would be too much pessimistic, like not enabling Linux anymore for, for the workloads that we were looking for. But instead, the results that we got were indeed confirming what we thought, what, what they think about Linux. Obviously, the latency reported by this more pessimistic that cover all the cases that shows the root case, the root cause, they, they are larger than cyclic tests because cyclic tests cannot get all, all, all the possible cases or it will take too, too longer to hit one of these pessimist case. 
Still, even with all the pessimism, we are, we are below one millisecond, like we show on, on some uh, architectures. And also on, on more complex architecture, we, sh we show that it's still like even being super pessimist, almost unrealistic pessimist, the, the latest it's, it's on the two or four milliseconds, right? <clears throat> Which might be too large for some use case that we are seeing, but it's not for the automotive uh, case, for example. And we have a strong evidence. So with that work, can we say that Linux was theoretically proof as real-time operating system? No, there's still a long way to go, right? Uh, and the main point is that uh, the focus of the parent RT, for example, of the of the major focus of the real-time Linux kernel community was in the scheduling latency. But the scheduling latency, even though it's a big part of the problem, it, it's not the main goal. The main goal is the response time of a test. It's not when a test starts to run, but when the, the test ends uh, the computation. And this involves other parts of the system, like like scheduling and locking, and then things get more complex. But, well, we have an example of this integration, and what else can we do, right? What, what, what is the, the lesson learned with this, this theory joint with in the preemption? Should, should we start from practice? Should we start from theory? <clears throat> the point is that, the main find is that it's not a chicken egg problem, it's an evolution problem, right? We need, we need to balance and bring new things from theory and mixing it up with new, new code and make things working together, right? Is there a way, is there any evidence that this is possible given that the Linux kernel evolves fast and that we are there or, or that does, does Linux kernel developers care that much about it, right? And, and here we have a, another example with my great example. So, my great disable is a synchronization mechanism from the parent RT that temporarily avoids a task to be migrated from one processor to another, right? It is good because it's a, it avoids disabling the preemption that, that causes the scheduling latency, right? That's why it's, it's good in one hand. On the flip side, it, it breaks one assumption that we use on the schedulers, which is being the, the working conserving, like that deadline assumes it's working conserving or that is that the, the AM high guest uh, threads will be able to run on the AM processors of a system. And, and this created a discussion on LKML because uh, some people were trying to, to use migrated disable on the no preemptive RT kernel because it would facilitate their, their lives. On the other hand, it would create for us a problem on the scheduling uh, subsystem. And during this discussion, one, one nice may was when Peter came up with some, some algorithm. Okay, this is the algorithm I suggest to, to allow us to, to mitigate this problem. We will create tools to, to find the worst case. And we will also try to update this with the theory that we are creating. So that's a good example that we can uh, go forward and continue to try to mix these, uh, these two words with the acceptance of the community as well, right? Because the results are good at the end. <clears throat> so, where else do, do we need to put effort on this, right? Uh, <clears throat> one point is the SCAD deadline, and you can check my presentation and with Yuri last year at DevConf. Uh, for example, currently, the, the design of SCAD deadline uh, doesn't allow tests with different CPU masks to share a CPU, right? Because of global schedule. But some per CPU kernel threads need to run as SCAD deadline. For example, uh, we might need to boost some per CPU threads like a RCU for a, for a given time, right? So uh, we, we have this need of having arbitrary priority affinities on the Linux curve. We have some theories like the, the same partition or some level of dynamic partitioning that, that could be useful for that. But more resource is required. Uh, another thing is that currently we, we ignore the overheads inside the system, right? And also the methodology that we use to test SCAD deadline is basically informal. We, we put some user space tests to run and, and see if they reply before the deadline, but we don't try to understand what is going inside the operating system. 
And this had led us to have problems in, in the past, like with uh, uh, with uh, tasks with deadline shorter than the period, for example. Another point is that with a lot with proxy execution that is currently on the parameter T, we have the priority inversion protocol that that works like this. If I have a highest priority thread waiting on a lower priority, this lower priority will inherit the priority of the highest to avoid a, a, a task with a mid priority to postponing all this batch of all the sequence of people depending on the law. So <clears throat> This, this algorithm, it works for single processors for fixed priority schedulers, like the FIFO scheduler, but not for, it was not designed like for multiple cores and neither designed for um, deadline-based schedulers, right? This protocol was later extended with a deadline inheritance, but it has some new issues and you can check it out on the presentation last year. There is this initiative that is implementing proxy execution, uh, that, that is promising. It's a good mechanism, but it still needs some kind of background to, to get some corner cases. And so on. <clears throat> no, this presentation was faster than I thought. So my final remarks are, okay, well, we had uh, a lot of progress in the real-time Linux as a community in the last years, right? Or last decade even, we are getting old. <laughs> so we have the brain 30, we have SCAD deadline, we have lots of tools. <clears throat> and uh, most importantly, in the last years, we've been seeing this need of, of Linux on safety critical systems. And now the automotive is not no our door. Uh, but, but there is even more, there is industry 4.0, there is the edge computing, there is also the low latency use case that we are at support, right? So these are demanding more sophisticated analysis, right? But for us to be able to give better response for, for the requests, for example, from our customers, but also to, to create this evidence that will enable real-time Linux to go further, to, to get new markets, that require these, these more sophisticated kind of evidences and documentation that show that Linux works fine, right? And uh, the difference between us and uh, these other real-time operating systems that sometimes were designed to be real-time operating systems since the beginning that were the designed with uh, certification on the mind to target in the, and to get certification for this kind of application, right? Linux, Linux was not signed that way, and uh, but still we can we, we can find a way to make to give these evidences uh, based on the things that we already have, and, and the scheduling and real time community, it's well receptive for these more theoretical like work because it actually makes our lives easier at the end, right? And it avoids us to facing problems in the future because we didn't take in consideration this, this crazy uh, algorithm analysis that uh, the, the academics are doing, right? And, and we have learned how to deal with it now. So yeah, that's it. Thank you all. Uh, I have a lot of support from research people, so please check the, the Red Red Research Buff. They are nice people and feel free to, to talk to me about research as well. And that's it. Mm, we have a Actually, we have uh, two questions. The first is from Caroline. What about uh, real time on ARM? Okay, uh, each ARM board has its own uh, set of problems that are derivated from the board support pack, right? Uh, some have uh, drivers upstream, some doesn't. So assuming that the hardware is upstream, support is upstream, there is no problem, right? The, the primitives of the parameter T, they are all architecture independent. There might be now some glue on architecture dependent code to make it work, but uh, it, it's not necessarily part of the, the core of the real-time features. They're, they're mostly all hardware independent. So yes, Linux parameter T on uh, ARM, it works. 
ARM people, or the people that work on ARM, they, they supported the development of uh, Prem30 and these kernel features. So yeah, it, it works. And, and we are ready, assuming that the board support package is upstream or that it works fine. Okay, thank you for the reply. We have a more question for you, so get ready. Uh, Alexander is making more deeply, more technically. I don't know if you are able to read yes, or yes. show this. Okay, he's pointing out that some part of the kernel, for instance, transparent use tables are currently not compatible with a preemptive uh, real time. Yes. And he's asking if this block for upstream uh, preempt RT. So the, the last uh, question first. No, it's not a blocker for the preempt RT upstream. It's now it's not the disabled for all the cases. It's disabled on or kernel because it might hold the the virtual memory lock the semaphore for too long, and there are some use cases of people that because of the way that their applications were designed, this caused uh, an undetermination. Because it's not because of the preemptivity, it's because the, the, the virtual memory semaphore, it's a huge kernel lock and can cause this kind of, uh, of uh, issues. Again, it's not preemptivity, it's just because it's a, a big kernel lock. And it's been quite a while that people are trying to find a way to improve it. It's not easy. So yes, the, the transparent huge page is, is disabled. Also, the, this kind of uh, heuristic work uh, is generally not required that much for many users on the printer T because they actually like to reserve the, the resource by themselves manually instead of trying to use some heuristics like the transparent huge page. Thank you. Oh, actually, there are a lot of questions. I'm trying to go one by one. The most voted one uh, will be the next one, and that is from William. Uh, has there been interest from the new automotive engineering uh, effort uh, to using the real-time kernel? Yes, yes. Mainly for the requirement of six criticals. Looking forward. And next is from Daniel. I see a need for real-time workload inside the KVM virtual machine What's your take uh, on that? It works. <laughs> we have, <clears throat> uh, we, there is even a team on Red Hat. Luis Capitolino is the head of the team that uh, we have been working as a team uh, for three or four years already, making uh, the KVM RT and the kernel RT working together well. We have good results, but still it's just being applied for a single use case, which is telco. And, and the results are quite impressive. Uh, but I, I advise talk to Luis about uh, this, this more, okay, uh, these other needs other than, than telco with uh, the KVMRT. Luis can, 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 can give a more business-like uh, answer for this. Good, thank you. It's great to hear about this. Uh, we have uh, also one question from uh, Varan. What about SMIs uh, x86 uh, or any under hypervisor? Does uh, preemptive the determinist still hold? Yes, they, and also it's a good point because the SMI looks like a hyper, like if the bare metal becomes a hyper, hypervisor, right? We have a something on a lower level that stalls the operating system that runs on top of it, right? It does not change the way that the preemptrt works. The preemptrt is still deterministic. It's just that you need to account this interference from the lower level uh, layer, right? So if your SMIs uh, run for like uh, 10 microseconds and still these 10 microseconds on top of the latency of the preemptrt uh, doesn't cause you a failure or if it's still good for you, it's okay, right? It's just yet another workload. So it does not affect the parameter T model. It just affects the results that you achieve on that architecture. But if it's, if it's a hardware or if it's a, a virtual machine. 
Okay, I, 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 Caroline, what is missing oh. to make Linux safe, critical for automotive? Lots of things, lots of things. Standardization, uh, creating more evidences, try to understand what are the evidence that we need to create. And there is an effort now at Red Hat to try to, to figure this out. Uh, will, will that happen? Yes, for sure, for sure. Uh, as the default OS on this use, okay, the default OS is another thing, right? Uh, Linux will probably use on safety critical, right? But some a, a, a low level of criticality now, right? It will not control brakes, it will not control the, the steering wheel, but it can control like dashboards or other things that require uh, uh, timing and safety. But but it's still the the, the ACU. Uh, B level, which is the ACUD is something that is more complex, but anyways, uh, uh, there's no need for Linux to be the, the full OS. There is a lot of problems to be resolved. I hope in the future we can achieve such a level of, uh, of confidence and results, right? It, it will take some time, I think. Personal take. <laughs>